This video will explain what haplogroups are. We will also talk about the evolution of haplogroups and how to understand haplogroup migration paths and why they have become so popular. In particular, why mitochondrial DNA have had such prominence in ancient DNA research. And if you stick around to the end, you will see if there is a scientific proof for the existence of Adam and Eve. In order to understand what haplogroups are, you need to understand how human DNA is organized in chromosomes and how chromosomes are inherited, i.e. what chromosome recombination is. In your cell you have 23 chromosomes, of which one is the sex chromosome, X or Y, and you have mitochondrial DNA. Chromosomes exist in duples. That is, you have one from your father and one from your mother. Mitochondrial DNA sits outside of the nucleus and is only carried over in the egg cell, that is, from your mother, and not in the sperm from your father. This is your genome. You can understand the genome as a sequence of characters, C, G, A, and T, approximately 3 billion base pairs long. The size of the chromosomes are not the same. The largest, number 1, has more than 200 million base pairs. The smallest, 21, has only 46 million base pairs. Overwhelmingly, 99.9% .9 of the sequences that you have from your father and mother are identical. But given the size of the genome, a tenth of a percent gives millions of differences. Close relatives have few differences distant relatives will have more differences. Originally, these differences have come about due to mutations, and they accumulate over generations. Deep human history is learned by looking on these changes. I mentioned that you have chromosome duples, one from your mother and one from your father, but before they hand over their version of their chromosomes to you in the egg or sperm, they recombine the chromosomes they got on average about 70 times per generation, chromosomal crossover. So you as a person is a combination of multiple ancestors, not only your paternal or maternal lineages, but thousands of your ancestors. And on the flip side of that, eventually going back far enough in history, you will have ancestors from whom you carry no DNA. To understand this, Let's have a look on the figure. From bottom up in the figure, you have 23 chromosome pairs, 26 chromosomes, plus your mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA comes from the mitochondria outside the nucleus of the, your cell, and is the first type of ancient DNA researchers were able to extract, as there is multiple copies of mitochondria per cell, as compared to only one of the nucleus DNA, and thus much more of it and easier to extract from thousand year old pieces of bone. Okay, so back to topic. Going back one generation to your parents, you will have the mentioned about 70 recombination stretches of DNA, plus the number of chromosomes and your mitochondrial DNA. And so on, adding the number of recombinations each generation. So 10 generations back, you will have more than 700 stretches of DNA from different ancestors. And on the left side of the graph, we have the percentage of all your ancestors that contributed the DNA to you. The number of ancestors you have doubles every generation, and eventually the number of stretches of DNA you have from various ancestors is less than the number of ancestors you have. So after about 10 generations, about half of your ancestors will have given you no DNA. In reality, the number of ancestors does not double every generation, as that assumes that all your ancestors to be totally unrelated. And this was definitely not the case, in particular among hunter-gatherers. The population size was smaller and thus ancestors were related. The number of homozygosus by descent segments indicates relatedness among ancestors. See my video Ice Age Population Size where this is used to understand Upper Paleolithic forager population structure. So what then are haplogroups? Well, it is a stretch of DNA that is unchanged through generations. 
except then obviously by genetic mutations. So it is not sliced through these recombinations. In humans, there are two principal such stretches of DNA. One, mitochondrial DNA, it is only inherited from your mother, your maternal side. The other is the Y chromosome, that is only inherited from your father, your parental side. Most DNA ancestry sites you may find on the web for testing your ancestry sequences part of your mitochondrial DNA and or Y chromosome. Depending on the amount of DNA sequenced, you may then find relatives. The frequencies of haplogroups will then vary in different ethnic groups. For example, the R1A is considered to be associated with the Indo-European migration. But it is more complex than that. For example, R1A1A is common among Ashkenazi Jews, which are not of Indo-European origin. So it has been suggested that this is due to mixture, which may be the case. But for the specific case of Ashkenazi Levites, it turns out that they are of the haplogroup R1A, M5A2, which is more common in Asia. There are a lot of haplogroup, mitochondrial or Y chromosome migration maps linking a haplogroup to some major migration event. There are several events of haplogroup spread, like the mentioned R1A1A of the Indo-Europeans. But one need to dig deeper, as exemplified by the Ashkenazi Levite case. And the situation is more complex in general with regards to Y chromosome and in particular with regards to mitochondrial DNA. To take yet another example, the mitochondrial haplogroup M in modern population common in Asia and extremely rare in Europe. But this was not always the case. It was common in Upper Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age, in Europe as well. We know this from ancient DNA studies. See my video Ice Age Europe, link in the description below. So there has been changes in haplogroup frequencies due to migration and population bottlenecks. Let me try and explain the root cause for this, looking on the mitochondrial DNA. So the only difference between you and your mother in mitochondrial DNA will be mutations, and so on following your maternal line. Under the assumption that there is no significant selection on mitochondrial DNA and a random constant mutation frequency, we have a clock for the age of the DNA. The fact that we have ancient mitochondrial DNA makes it possible to determine the mutation frequency, that is, the speed of this clock, and the clock is slow. In fact, it is so slow that when considering the main haplogroups M and N, we are 62 to 95,000 years, not far from the out of Africa event. So what about Adam and Eve, Asker and Embla in Norse mythology? When did they live? The coalescence date for all modern human mitochondrial DNAs is of 120 to about 200,000 years ago, and of 62 to 95,000 years ago for the haplogroup L3, the lineage from which all non-African mitochondrial haplogroups descend. This makes 95,000 years ago the earliest time of the last major gene exchange between non-African sub-Saharan African populations. So Eve lived 120 to 200,000 years ago. Of course, there were more women living at that time, but none of them managed to leave a direct descendant in the current population. Similar estimates, looking on the Y chromosomal Adam, estimates that he lived 200 to 300,000 years ago. To understand why we end up with an Adam and Eve, at the same time as in non-African we all carry archaic human DNA from Neanderthals, let's revisit the genealogical ancestor figure. The figure is for chromosomes that recombines, but if we consider the haplogroups, the washout is exponentially faster. Each generation, the likelihood of carrying the mitochondrial DNA of a particular 
maternal ancestor, halves, as indicated in red in the figure. Population bottlenecks eventually bring ancestral lines out of circulation. That is all for today, my friends. These are some of the references used in this review. The paper, Pleistocene Mitochondrial Genomes, suggests a single major dispersal of non-African and a late glacier population turnover in Europe. And the paper, a revised timescale for human evolution based on ancient mitochondrial genomes. And the paper, Genetic Variation in the R1A clade among Askenashi Levites, Y chromosome. Also, some of the material in this video comes from the presentation by David Reich at Harvard Museum of Natural History. I will link the talk and references to the paper in the description below. Thanks for listening. Till next time, I wish you all the best.